Hi there. No, this is not clickbait. We actually have an interview with Nassim Nicholas Taleb, the guy that says he doesn't do media. He takes pride in not talking too often to journalists. He mostly talks to his scientific community peers. Taleb might seem rude or harsh, but he's actually blunt and honest. Hi. Hello, Mr. Taleb, and thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you, thank you. I'm very it's honored. an honor to talk uh, to uh, a person, a guy that's been called the philosopher of the 21st century. Are you okay with that? No, because I'm not a philosopher. <laughs> I am, uh, I, I'm not, I mean, like labels, I don't like labels. And so, so in my mind, I, uh, I have actually an aphorism that explains it. In my mind, uh, being uh, uh, someone that self-identifies with something, typically that person is a fraud. And okay. that was created by leagues before. You, you identify with the problem you're currently working on. And so, uh, you... so I work on probability. So my profession is to work with probability. So I have technical skills and probability. I also have cultural skills and probability. And, and try to work with that. And probability has a beautiful aspect that when COVID came, you can work with uh, scientific papers and say, you know, Statistically, this is not uh, uh, converging or something, and then therefore your sample size doesn't fit the claim you're making, or you can use it. So everything is based on statistics and probability, everything with information based on that. In your books, you're talking against uh, taking decisions uh, simply based on statistics. Yeah. Exactly. So, so, so but, but, but there's an asymmetry. Sometimes you do take based on statistics. So there is a fundamental asymmetry. If you use it right, you know when not to use it. You see, like, for example, if you're an expert on hammers, okay, like a lot of people are telling me, well, you know what, uh, not liking uh, the Gaussian distribution is like saying I don't like hammers. No, I love hammers, and I can be an expert on hammers and use hammers for nails, uh, but prefer not to use hammers for brain surgery. You see? Okay. You have to find, once you understand probability, you find where it applies and where it does not apply. And, and how the ancients had a sophisticated way to incorporate both probability and uh, uh, effect of an event. And there's also popular wisdom. You're uh, sometimes turning to popular wisdom, like the, the taxi driver. I'm turning uh, more than often uh, to my father. He, he's all, also very wise, but very popular, like a simple person that understands the way of the world. So okay. what are you missing? There is a reason for that, and we're going to get, hopefully, to religion. Uh, what happened is that whatever you learn at school, and that was not much just my position, if you read the ancient skeptics, that what was they skeptical against? Pseudo-experts, you see? So if you look at how we deal with uncertainty, what we've survived hundreds of millions of years, so we got to have the right reactions. You see, that's exactly probabilistically. You had reactions. And sometimes without understanding why, because it's widened to us to have these reactions. So we must have a fitness to the, the risk environment through our intuition, through our paranoia, through our uh, um, uh, extreme risk aversion in some circumstances. Okay, and, and that mechanism is a mechanism that has been refined by, 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 by of course, hundreds of millions of years, maybe. So it has more scientific significance than some paper written by psychologists telling you this move is logical, not logical, uh, rational, not ra rational, uh, acceptable, not acceptable. And, and therefore, all these psychologists, uh, and I call them idiots to their names, the face, and hopefully you will, you will uh, I don't know what, what, what term you use, you would use in Romania to call these guys. Oh, it's okay, idiots, yes. Yeah, it is. I mean, they come in and then they wrote, they do some experiment, and their experiments usually don't replicate half the time. And when they replicate, they replicate only under some weird conditions. And then to tell you that, you know what, this is wrong. So you're, you're saying this is wrong, and you've been going through this uh, in your books, uh, telling that this is wrong. But on the other hand, the world's been changing so fast for the past uh, 200 years that. Um, Popular wisdom is not is not enough to go from one point A to point B. Not, not really. To the contrary, in fact, if you think that things have changed, and and I tell you that the underlying structure of the world has changed, uh, maybe uh, uh, quantitatively but not qualitatively. 
And, and then we know pretty much it's precisely for that reason that all these studies in psychology and all of that, they're like baby science, not even science, economics, baby science. So to explain again, engineering, we understand engineering very well, okay? And I keep explaining the difference between an engineering framework in anti-fragile, for example. I, you know, if you bang on your computer, it breaks. And, and, and the attributes of engineering is that, for example, take a watch, okay? It, it does, there's no partial watch. If something breaks, it stops. If the computer breaks, it stops. Whereas in nature, human body, we have things that, that, that a lot of auxiliary mechanism, it's a lot richer. And the complex system is based on interaction. So once you do more advanced mathematics than the ones used by these, let's call them idiots, okay? Then you realize from the more advanced mathematics that uh, you uh, effectively, your, your uh, grandmother or grandfather or great-grandfather or great-great-great-great-great-great-aunt were actually had the right, okay, uh, decision-making framework. You see, and, okay. and particularly for, for, for tail risks, if you use complex systems, okay, you understand that, that all these analogies don't really work. And a lot of the things we were uh, uh, living in, all these structures were designed not for humans, usually by top down. And then there's another attributes of complex systems, and, and, and which is why it clashes with the idea of an expert. Uh, look at an ant colony. Was it designed by anyone? Or at least, is there a, yes. a regulator? Is there a reg okay, look at a, a, a flock of birds. These are spontaneous formations coming bottom up okay. with some basins. And same thing for human society. So if you want to do science, do it the right way. And if you do it the right way, you realize a lot of things you don't know, and it brings you back to the ancients. Now, granted, there are things, mistakes we make today that are uh, uh, mistakes because the environment has changed, okay? Uh, but I, I would tell you that typically, if you're making mistakes in an environment, say, like for example, uh, you go to a casino and you tend to make a mistake by, by assuming there's something called uh, the gambling fallacy, by assuming that the sequence, you figure out the sequence. If you make a mistake in today's environment, like say the casino, it may be a mistake, all right? But overall, overall, they're not costly. Depends on how much money you're bringing to the table. Typically, they're not costly because, because plus, there is a correcting mechanism. Those who make these mistakes, if they're really mistakes, they exit the system. That's the okay. last idea of, of skin in a game. So, and, and my point, the skin in a game, is that if those who make decisions, okay, have a, uh, a risk of exiting the gene pool, then you have a, a, a continuous recalibration of the system, and that's evolutionary. When it comes to religion, and this is why uh, uh, you know, I have a problem with uh, what people call scientific atheism and stuff like that, and, and, and you guys have tried it, you've had your Ceausescu years, and, and you've had uh, communism, and you have things, and we're, I'm now in a, a 12th century monastery uh, built in 1050, 1157. Uh, why, why are you there? Uh, it's a university is based here, and I feel comfortable in such a structures. Anyway, so uh, let me tell you okay. why, what I take from religion. There is no way you can transmit intergenerational experiences with ideas. You transmit them with, with uh, uh, customs, interdicts, and, uh, and, and habits. And so there okay. is an evolutionary aspect to it. In risk management, for example, there are things you do not do, you see. And so religion has that aspect, you know, that functional aspect that cannot be replaced okay. by, by, by other forms of taboos because it's harder to connect. That's the first one. The second one is most of these modernistic approaches to things, how we behave, read things literally. Mm -hmm. So to give you an idea, Something I think I address in Skin in the Game, you know, I don't know my books very well because I don't read them. <laughs> okay, so I think in one of the books, I address the problem as follows. Uh, you remember there was a tsunami in one of the, in the South Pacific, uh, South, uh, in, in, in uh, South e, uh, Southeast Asia. Okay. In, uh, in like 2004, 2005. I don't remember okay. the details. Now, uh, the, tr the people who were on the coast 
who sleeps on the coast, who sleep on the coast, were, 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 were affected and died, many of them died. Now there were tribes, ancestral tribes, who never sleep on the coast. Hmm. For some weird reason, they would only sleep on high land, and and they say that, they, and the reason could be that their ancestors. So you, you're you're saying that religion is a store of wisdom. It's a Darwinistic uh, idea. Those who have the right ideas survive, not necessarily because the idea exactly. is good, but because using it. Let me give you another example I use from Skinner and the Gang. It makes absolutely no logical possible sense, okay, to subscribe to the cash route of the Jewish cash root, okay? But it has, but, but once you get into it, it's beautiful, there's a lot of rules. And, and I myself try to subscribe by the, uh, by the Orthodox uh, calendar, you know, food-wise, so I, I follow it. Oh, okay, Why? so you're, you're fasting. I, I fast on, uh, on, uh, on, on fast days. Mm. Wednesday and uh, Friday. Fridays? Fridays, yeah, and on some on, on fast days, forty days for forty days here. But anyway, but let's say why is it that um, it's functional to have follow a kashrut, Jewish kashrut, and our Orthodox kashrut has some other functional reasons. Um, every every religion has some sort of fast. Exactly, exactly. So let's take the Jewish kashrut. Okay, they discovered that those who eat together, you see, band together. So if you could, you have to eat, you know, with other Jewish people. So it creates networks of communities throughout, it created throughout the Mediterranean and Europe where you can have trade. And, and, and I explain it with scaling. Uh, what's better to meet a hundred people once or one person a hundred times? Okay. You see, this is where you, you start having a, a network of communities who know one another. Therefore, there's trust to conduct commerce. Exactly. Yeah, so it helped them build networks of commerce. Okay, so you go from a town to a new town, you have to eat. You have to go follow, find the community where you eat, and then you do business and they ask you where you come from. That's the first thing. And the second one, it allows them to concentrate, therefore to survive when there's a big attack on them. If they're dispersed, you know, you attack them separately. Here they eat together. So for example, that's one benefit of religion. So the problem of... Uh, treating religion as something, uh, what I call uh, epistemic, by saying, well, that story, it means you're taking the story literally. Science is literal and epistemic. Religion okay. is epistemic, uh, belief-based, pistis, okay. credo. Now, for example, what does the word credo mean in Romanian? I believe, credo. Not really, I, it means I trust. I trust, okay. Ah, if you see the, the credo, the credere, it means I trust. Okay? okay, I trust to go with it. Now, when you go to movies, to the movie, okay, you know, and you're watching a, say, a movie or a thing and there's blood. You know it's tomato juice, whatever it is, or some synthetic product. Yes. You know it. But for the sake, okay, of the movie, you believe the story. Of course. Okay, because otherwise you're spoiling your afternoon by not believing. But you're not going to stop the movie and say, I can't believe it. They're, they're making fun yeah. of me. It's, it's tomato juice. Yeah. But did you hear about the next Christopher Nolan the movie? Uh, it's, gonna, it's called Tenet. And they try to do a movie without visual effects. Even the plane uh, on that's crashing in the movie, it's a real plane. So they're trying to make it real without video effects. And now we, when we are at the peak of the technology for video effects. So... It's coming back to, no, 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 we try to do it without stunts, without any graphics. It's just pure cinematography, whatever that is. So in, in some way, we are trying to find back. back trust in Maybe what you're seeing. It is a blowback because theater is organic and natural. Cinema is not because you go too much into uh, whenever it's like painting. It used to okay. be the details which you paint, you've been expression of skills how good you yes. are at, do, at very similitude at doing replicating something. And then you can get inventive. Now you just, you know, uh, you know, you can have your, your dog wag, uh, you know, the, 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 the tail. Yeah. The, the and then you can sell it. So it's, there's no longer the signaling. So, so you take something to its complete, to, the, to its complete natural uh, yeah. uh, uh, conclusion and the thing breaks down, but no, to go back. I, I, to I, I, 
I, I'm having these uh, questions here. I didn't get any chance to go through them. I'm using paper for this interview because I really want to ask you a few things. And I know yeah. your time is very limited, so please yeah. bear with me. I, I, I want to ask you uh, some, some things. So you've been talking about the pandemic uh, since the beginning of, uh, of the year. And you've been uh, letting people know that this is real. Once you go past the first uh, thousand of uh, cases, there's no statistics. Uh, everything is becoming very, uh, let's say, improbable. I don't know. How, how should we approach uh, the time that comes after okay. this? Because we've been going through this for the past nine months already, and it's getting worse. Yes. Okay. The, 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 look at China. Radical move first. What I think in the West we should be doing is what we suggested. First of all, you don't understand anything, you shut down. You have no idea how to transmit it. As we're gaining that information, we get a little more precise in the reaction. Now, what's happening is the exact opposite. Governments in the beginning assumed some precise uh, mechanism, and then they were wrong, and then another one. So from the beginning, masks, quarantines, and stuff. Now, going forward, we think the solution is dual. Overactive testing and masks and do business as usual. To come here to the Balaman Monastery, the 12th century monastery, I will, I will remind you, I took a, a, a PCR before flying, and upon arrival, they took my PCR. So I know I am negative, okay? And people around me know I am negative, so therefore, you know, they can invite me to a dinner party, you see? So, but if you, every time you, you wanna have a classroom uh, filled with students or something, you had tests, we computed that even as the test is imprecise, it would collapse the pandemic. Because what is central about a pandemic is what I call the extremist time, comes from multiplicative effects. So you, you don't want to eliminate, you want to demultiply, and anything helps. Masks help enormously. That's number so one. So masks and tests everywhere. Yeah. There are auxiliary things that we mentioned is eliminate super spreaders. Because things well, that yes. they are absolutely spread. So, for example, your uh, uh, conference, if it were, how many people are physically, you know, that conference? Then? They should have had uh, in the hundreds and thousands of people uh, uh, attending. Physically attending? Yes. Okay, so do they have masks? Well, we are not going to have a physical event. It's going to be only online. So okay. So therefore, so there is not a super spread event. There you go. This is the explanation. It's soon. But, that they would, the, but do, that. Do, do, do you believe that um, stupidity is a super spreader nowadays? Because we've seen people denying uh, that the COVID, uh, COVID exists. And yeah, they no, say, no. we even have teachers uh, telling to their children, you shouldn't wear a mask. You're not an animal. Okay. The government shouldn't okay. control your face. But, but let me let me tell you that, that what happened is that there's a mechanism called minority rule. I, for example, if I see people that are not wearing a mask, I, I zap them off my uh, personal life. Okay. Like in America, if you show up in Costco without a mask, you have people taking your picture and it goes online. Okay. So there's a public, so which in fact may be unfair for the person, but at the same time, all we need to do is build a culture to, to bring down the pandemic. So it's not going to be perfect. A lot of people are, you know, let, let me tell you, particularly in an environment like the United States where people value freedom, you're going to have a lot of uh, psychopaths. Of course. You see them as an excuse. And, and uh, uh, because even libertarian, libertarianism, they start citing you. Uh, I mean, it's very simple. They have on their bookshelves, Antifragile, my book, not understanding what Antifragile is about. They have Ayn Rand, and then they have Hayek. And, and, and when some guy was arguing, this is a book, I told him, this is an open Hayek. And on this page, he explains to you that government are necessary for pandemics and wars <laughs> and natural catastrophes. We need government. For, that's, that's a function of the government. So, or an anti-fragile, I say, I get anti-fragile, I get better if I jump one meter, but I die if I jump six meters. So make sure exactly. you take all of it. It's, you know, it's not making this, if you die, you're not anti-fragile. So, and then there is also one mechanism that you don't understand about the, the, the libertarianism is that you have to avoid harming others. It's called a non aggressive yes. principle. By not marrying a mask, I am harming others. So uh, if you were to write uh, Black Swan again, it would definitely have uh, at least a big part of it covering the COVID. 
No, it's but already it, covered it's, it's the black the, swan. George, it is already covered in the black swan. I don't need, I would not add one sentence. Okay. It you wouldn't covered. add. Not not a word. Why? <laughs> because it's already I, I mean in two thousand and um uh, five when I wrote it, uh I spoke to the great Benoit Mandelbrot and then we told him what is do you think is very fat tailed? And we mentioned pandemics. There was no study of pandemics, but could figure it out. I mean, if you, all you need is one thing, sometimes N of one, to figure out that a single disease killed a third of the population of the Mediterranean and what's now Europe, okay? That number is sufficient to establish some properties. Later, uh, with uh, my collaborator, Pasquale Cirillo, we did the formal study for nature physics. And then, of course, that was exactly, we didn't need it, all right? But we did it, you know, to be formal and play the game and, and be, uh, uh, and we did some techniques called extreme value theory. And, and basically, it's the biggest risk we have, pandemics. But still, <laughs> you're arguing that a pandemic like this, it's not a black swan because we knew about it, that it would eventually come. Black swans, you don't right. expect them. So this is actually something we should have prepared for. It's consistent with statistical properties, and I warned we should prepare for more than our ancestors. You see, for one central reason is that we're more connected. When you asked me early on, you said the world is different. We're more, even more connected. So being paranoid today, your grandfather and grandmother are more right today than they were then. So, so the, the problem is that we have these idiots, and, and let me call them idiots because they are idiots. And in January, uh, COVID had killed maybe uh, by February a thousand people. Yes, a thousand people, and they they give you numbers of people who drown in their swimming pool. Okay, but yeah. Now, the number of the people who drown in a swimming pool in the past is very representative of how many people will die will will drown in a swimming pool in the future. It's very stable. Uh, because that's uh, uh, what I call mediocre stand statistics. That's where the bell curve works. And because if you if you drown in your swimming pool, I'm sure it won't happen to you because you know I right. don't have a swimming pool, but it's okay. So, okay. So, but if 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 someone is foolish enough to drown in her or his swimming pool, it doesn't cause a neighbor to drown in of her course. or his swimming pool. But if I have COVID, I'll give it to the neighbor. So there's a multiplicative effect that doesn't exist with car accidents. All these sources of risk. It only yes. exists for pandemics, all right? And we have only 72 in recorded history. <laughs> exactly. So that, that brings me to my next question. You're arguing also that this kind of events also produce, a, by consequence, other events. And those might become the real black swans. So what should we expect from a pandemic like this in the next few years? Because most people are waiting to get back the old normal. That, that's not coming uh, back, I'm sure of that. Destroy the bureaucratic uh, establishment, to destroy the administrative uh, bureaucratic establishment. To destroy the bureaucratic okay. establishment. That's a very, very bold statement. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean like something like World Health Organization that uh, more harm with the pandemic than, than, than help. In okay. the beginning, it said there's no reason to wear masks. Well, you tell them, okay, what do we got to lose wearing a mask? I mean, look at, we know pictures in history, of people wearing masks, okay? Of course. And, and we've had lazarettos in history. So they were there to, because they, again, they're not going to, they're no skin in the game type bureaucrats. And to discredit them and favor localism, because the mayors of small towns not have these intellectuals trying to mess with their lives, you see? You got to remember one thing, intellectuals have always been wrong, okay? about uh, uh, risky things, always. I mean, they're okay. wrong, of course, about communism, they're wrong about this, they're wrong about the religion, they're wrong about... But why do we go to school, Mr. Taleb? Why do we go to school? Why do we learn things? Well, I mean, there are things you learn in school that are valuable, and they classify them in class A, for example. If you're learning uh, physics, the, the physics is fine. But what, what these uh, uh, assholes do, is they tell you because a physicist is an expert at physics, an economist is an expert on uh, economy. No, you see? Yes. You, okay, because an expert, we, we should classify schools in two categories. Schools that are schools where you learn things, 
okay? Uh, medicine, medicine is messy, but medicine is still, and medicine has, has a very, very, very strong connection to reality, okay? Medi it's, em it's empirical at first. You need to know how to cut and sew it's and... micro, it's micro also. Okay. I said as a, it's much easier to macro BS and micro BS because you see the results. If you have an incompetent dentist, you will see it. Yes. If you have a competent mathematician, you will see it. If you have an incompetent epidemiologist, you won't see it. It's macro. Yeah, but we, we, we now have incompetent governments and we see it and nothing yeah. happens because we choose democracy and we choose to go to vote and yeah. we choose for the lesser <laughs> evil. And in the end, everything happens back again. No, this is not democracy. Democracy is if you are, uh, uh, you know, in control, you, you know, of the environment in which you live, you don't have coercion by a certain class. This is not democracy. It's, it's much more vicious than, than democracy. If there's no democratic process when unelected bureaucrats start running your life poorly. Like, like as, as, as but you also have elected idiots that do the that's fine, bad thing. But that's, but that's organic. The way things best work best is bottom up. Where, How where, do you do that? Well, uh, localism. Localism has a stronger municipal base. Okay. And you pay taxes to your municipality. Okay. Like in Switzerland, Switzerland, or to some extent the United States. And this is why we are tr turning to city mayors uh, for uh, rapid response in case of any anything happens. Uh, city mayors or small towns, even better. Okay. Okay. Point. So you go back to how Italy was throughout the history, through how the world was throughout the the, the Roman Empire, and okay. and both of us were in both the Roman Empire and the Ottoman Empire. And yes. during the Ottoman Empire, it, there was no nation states. There was, uh, you know, local administration of towns, and people managed themselves, okay, managed within that, that environment. And that was the same with the Habsburg, and, and it was the same pretty much uh, throughout history. And also at the time, the state was like places like France that tried to be centralized. They were not centralized because the government was had no reach. There was no telephone. There was no. Uh, Internet, there was no so, and the government but, represented five okay. percent of the GDP, five to eight percent. But now in China, you have total control. They have micro control. They see everything. They have uh, tens and hundreds of millions of cameras, and they can control everything. Is it gonna work? No, because because things break down very quickly in, in that in that kind of environment. It has broken down in China once before, uh, and I okay. documented in the Ming Dynasty. Um, what happened in China uh, had a big rise, okay, because of, you know, decentralized, you know, uh, uh, mechanism. And then they had the Mandarin try to run it. A bunch okay. of people, the government, uh, same thing is happening now in Europe. Uh, and same thing happened in Upper Egypt. The nation state, centralized nation state, is way inferior to a system of empire, empire with collection of city states. Like you're talking about uh, Switzerland, that's um, coming together all the cantons yeah, Germany, and uh, Germany, Germany, and also Germany, the lands. Yes. I'll go to the next question. I, I know your time is limited, but you're a trader by trade. Yes. So you, you understand money, you understand the commodity, you understand the volatility and all that. Yes. And these are times of great volatility. So uh, are you seeing opportunity these days or are you seeing okay. danger ahead? No, there's, I mean, the volatility doesn't change. And that's my whole stance, that's always there. It's like saying the risk of pandemic is not greater today than it was before. It's just part of the system. Um, if anything, uh, there have been uh, what they call the, Fed, the, the, the Fed put, the Federal Reserve put. It's like this injection of money into the system by buying directly commercial paper and notes and, and even beyond buying bonds of corporations. So the 23,000 bonds. Different, different categories of bonds that the Federal Reserve owns today. So, and that, that puts a floor on the market, so seemingly it lowers volatility. I, I, don't, I think maybe long run, maybe it will work short, short term till they, uh, the mechanisms, the, the world adapt, and then long run it's going to be volatile. Uh, but I think the response to the pandemic is uh, going to cost us a lot of problems later. But let me make one statement about the pandemic, that uh, economic statement. There are idiots who are bureaucratic idiots for a central state, and there's also idiots who are libertarian psychopaths passing for 
Uh, let's talk about the second category. All these people tell you, well, the shutdown is costing the economy. As if the virus was not going to cost the economy. You see? The, the, virus, is, the virus is dangerous for the economy. And, and what's happening is a lot of these contractions that we're seeing in the GDP of a lot of countries come from a natural risk aversion of people, and that's cultural to our day times. So let me give you an example. Uh, you know how much we spend for office safety in America? No. A huge, huge amount of GDP goes to office safety. Why? Because nobody wants to be sued. Mm -hmm. Because total loss. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so you have a huge office uh, thing, and then they make sure nobody's going to trip. Okay, although, you know, trip, you break something, you get stronger maybe, but still, the mentality is to spend a huge amount of money for safety. Okay. okay. Huge amount of money for that thing. Nobody wants to be sued. The burden on restaurants, okay, in New York City, you have these inspectors who come in, and test and check and count the cockroaches, all that burden is monstrous. Okay. So there's a lot of cost of GDP that goes into this, naturally, not, not, not necessarily from government. And, and likewise, um, uh, people, uh, whenever a plane crashes, people switch to driving. Yes. Uh, so, and so then you have more people do, uh, dying on the roads. Exactly. But there's a huge cost on airlines to avoid crashes. So, so we're spending uh, trillions to prevent crashes to have uh, the lowest possible error rate on the airline. It's great to me if I, if I like to fly, but it is not it is burdensome. So it's com therefore completely illogical to say how much we're spending against the pandemic under these circumstances, you see? Particularly that we're spending trillions on warheads, nuclear warheads, and not enough on testing. But let me tell you one thing about the behavior of consumers. The minute uh, a firm is tainted, you see, or the, there's, they discover in McDonald's or something, a small little defect, people don't go anymore. The minute they hear about it. With COVID, most of the contraction and economic activity came from companies that did not want to be sued by their employees. And restaurants, think about it, uh, you, you, you can eat a meal at home, you can order it or whatever, uh, or if you cook, I'm sure you cook you know, great Romanian food, so you want to do it, or you go to a restaurant, okay? So if enough people avoided going to the restaurant, that 95% of restaurants in New York were bust Okay, so this is, this is anti-fragile for the big system. That should work to, let's say, contain... What is anti-fragile for a big system? Is that this following level? And then, we need then, something like that for the, for the times coming because uh, yeah, many me, people are, are afraid their money is going to go, uh, it's going to lose no, value. Let me explain uh, how the economy is reacting, the whole system is, is built. So let, let, let me... Explain. When a plane crashes, the probability of next plane crashing is lower, no? Because we learn from the plane crash, so that's a healthy system. Uh, so system learns from the, the, the errors. So what's happening with this pandemic, is the pandemic is rather mild. I mean, the, the virus doesn't kill as much as, or doesn't harm people as much as polio, although we still don't know the side effects. And it doesn't resemble anything we know anyway. What is central here is that we are now prepared for the big pandemic. Mm -hmm. See, we are prepared because now we know how to close borders, we know how to do this, we know how to do that. We, we don't have to recreate a new narrative, okay? And, and at the level of, 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 of the individual, uh, there is a risk consciousness. And same thing happened in history. We had Justinian's plague, and it prepared people for a long time, for about seven, eight centuries, whatever, uh, okay? And then the Great Plague came, Supposedly, it's 14th century. People forget that it continued for five centuries. <laughs> so, uh, and, and things don't die down. In some, some places, it took 150 years to reach a town. But, so, so, what happened is that we are learning. Our system now is built. So, we are using Zoom now. Yes. That's an anti-fragile adaptation to the system. To try to make the best out of it. And effectively, and now we're going to have long-term alteration from that because we're going to have more meetings on Zoom, and, and I don't have to fly to uh, Arkansas, you know, for a lecture, okay? I, I will only go to Venice, so nice place, okay? Or, or Bucharest, which I like. So the idea is that uh, uh, you have adaptations of things, and whatever is fragile will collapse. So what are you expecting to collapse? Because I'm seeing uh, money as a big issue today. There's too much money in the wrong place. 
Yeah, okay, New York City's collapsed. Okay, then just said goodbye because New, New York, York City, City New York City is collapsing. It has collapsed. I mean, you drive okay. up in New York City, you have boarded up restaurants. Think about it. They're operating at such a narrow margin. I know from restaurant owners and, and some documents that a drop of 15% in revenues means you have to shut down. Okay. That's very, that's okay. And the other thing is uh, 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 office work in New York City. New York City is based on uh, people coming, like uh, a couple million people coming from Manhattan, that is, coming from the outside. Stores and people from Texas coming, you know, to shop in stores. So we have changed the habits of the consumers enough that the small difference, it was, New York was super leveraged on its uh, success story, and even then, not financially uh, uh, sound. But now, it's the same with all big cities. After all the pandemic, so the big cities co co contract for uh, exactly. some years. No, not necessarily uh, for some years. I mean, it could be permanent. Because okay. think about it. If, if, as I know, law firms or the firm, uh, firms I'm associated with, they say, okay, we're going to do things remote, but we'll have the office, you know, for, you know, 10%. You're in the monastery now, so you don't need to go to the big city. That exactly. I will go to the big city, but not, it's not, I'm not forced to, you see. So I have that extra optionality for me in my own life that it will, that you don't have the same structure of, uh, so, so this is, so you got to look at what happened from COVID, okay? Some our, time is, our, our time is running out. I have so many questions. So yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take uh, the last one. Okay, and yeah. I, I, I'm sure you're not going to like it. This is why it's the last one. What about uh, some people in the um, blockchain uh, industry and the cryptocurrency ecosystem uh, talk about, uh, uh, try and quote you uh, as um, to leverage their technologies and say that uh, their blockchain technologies are anti-fragile. Do you, do you, uh, how I, do you I, look I, at the blockchain and uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies? I mean, I think uh, the concept of cryptocurrency currency is important and blockchain is something uh, or ancient. It's a modernization of letter credit, which, you know, creates a transaction financial transaction automatically upon delivery of goods, for example. So there are good things in it. Uh, the problem is don't get too excited because it may, every good idea doesn't necessarily work. Uh, we need Bitcoin as a replacement or we need a currency that's not owned by government. And it's handy, but uh, I have to separate the good, uh, Bitcoin as a good idea that may work from these uh, weirdos, uh, you know, who cluster around Bitcoin, anti-fragile, who think it's a solution to the world's uh, uh, problem. And they only eat meat, they, only this, they, they read the Hayek, and they don't understand Hayek. So there's a, a crowd of people, you have to separate Bitcoin from Bitcoiners. The, the Bitcoiners are like some uh, cranks and lunatics and conspiracy theorists, uh, which is nice to have in society, but, but you want to stay, keep them uh, far away from, from your uh, landscape. So. I think it's a good idea, and I wrote this a good idea, and I own Bitcoin, and I've used Bitcoin. Okay, okay. and uh, uh, so far it's not a good reserve of, of uh, money. It will take years for it to stabilize because uh, unless the price stabilizes, it's not good to invest, put your money in something with fat tails. So we looked at the dynamics of it. It will take years before it, you can think of putting your money in. It, okay, as a store it's of still, it's, it's it's still early. Yeah, I mean, the fact that people may tell me, well, it may triple. I tell them, listen, this, that's not cash. Cash is not supposed to triple. Cash is supposed to stay yes. the same. Okay, so. So, where do we put our money for the next recession? I'm seeing a recession after the pandemic. You've been talking about this. Where you, put, uh, where you should put your money and tell what I've been doing, all right? Uh, I don't think that the problem is not so much a recession you have to worry about. Uh, the problem you have to worry about is the measures they're taking now may be hyperinflationary in the long run. Uh, oh. so, so you need to own some gold because it remains that as much as these Bitcoiners think they have a solution to problems, um, the Bitcoiners remind me of those people who are using Kindle who say, oh, I'm not never going to buy a book ever again, right? But now the book survived and I don't know if people are reading too much electronically. I see from my book sales that they zoomed in the beginning and then stabilize the low level electronic uh, thing. It's the same thing with gold is a real thing. 
All right. Uh, silver is a real thing. Copper is a real thing. Uh, farmland is a real thing. So there are a bunch of things. But there's also gold in the blockchain. You can buy gold through the blockchain. Yeah, Tax gold. Can, okay. I, I can also buy gold and store it in a, in a vault in, uh, in Switzerland. Okay. So that's blockchain. Or I can buy a paper, a GLD, on, uh, listed on, on a decent exchange and audit it. So, so the whole thing is, the, the idea is never, blockchain is not going to work in your head. If it's good in your head, it has to lead to a chain of practice. That, that met to it. And, okay. and also, the final thing I'm going to tell you that you, you're not going to like, blockchain and, and, and uh, Bitcoin are too traceable. Yes. Okay, so you're losing the segment of the prime user, user of, of these things. And maybe gold is traceable, but not as much. And, and there are techniques. So, so you, you realize now that, uh, that there's a dark segment of society that doesn't like it for that reason. And it's not going to work. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Mr. Taleb, thank you so very much. I would be Thanks so you. honored to have you in Bucharest, uh, hopefully in the next few years after the pandemic. Yeah, I, I definitely, I, I, like, I was there once. I hang around cafes for two, three days. And there's a mass atmosphere. Plus, you still drink, uh, uh, guess what, Turkish coffee. Or, yeah, I don't of know course. If yeah, of course. Most of the Romanian food is Turkish food, with, which we Ottoman. reinvented. We are all the, we are all Balkan, Ottoman. We are, uh, we are patriots. We spent 500 years in the Ottoman Empire. And you guys spent about 400. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm looking at you and I'm seeing the, a very familiar face. So your face is very familiar to me from my peers. In my country, so when I when I go to Romania, all right, and I talk to people, I feel I'm talking to people from my culture. There's something that clicks yes. in former Ottoman, particularly when they're Orthodox. Exactly. And anyway, I have some uh, genetics from uh, from from your parts. Okay. Yeah, the, the northern, uh, northern Macedonia. So so that may explain also the familiarity. But that's not common to me, not to the people around. Anyway. So uh, thank you, thank you so very much for thanks, taking the time. It, it, it was an honor, and uh, I think I'm I'm blessed to have uh, talked to you because after reading your books, I really, really believe you should be uh, named uh, the philosopher of the 21st century. But that's my opinion. It's not you, you, you cannot you cannot argue with this because this is my show. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Bosch. Thanks. Thank you. thank you, thank you, Mr. Taleb. Thanks. Fine. Bye. I want to take a moment and thank the people at Brand Minds for the opportunity to talk to Nassim Taleb and moderate him on stage. And I want to thank you for hanging on till the end of the video. You must be converted by now. So go ahead and read his books. They're like a cold shower or an antidote to chaos and um, anxiety during difficult times. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And we'll see you for the next video.